we're fortunate to have a man who has uh, prolifically been a, in, a, in, a, in no small way responsible for a lot of the music in your record collection over the last 30 years, uh, Mr. John Dent. And uh, I understand that he's going to be discussing with us um, a side of music production that uh, we, we may or may not know much about, but which is very, very important. And um, I myself am looking forward to uh, finding out some of the mysteries of mastering. And uh, please feel free to ask any questions a bit later on, but I think John's going to, first of all, just present um, some information that he's put together for this very purpose. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll hand things over to John now. Thank you very much. I'm going to talk on a couple of subjects. The first one is why master? Why do we actually want to master a record? Um, I'm also going to have a discussion on quality issues because um, with the introduction of MP3, iPod and internet downloads, um, it's very easy to lose sight of the fact that the original masters are of a significantly higher quality than you're all listening to. And, and I have um, a number of demonstrations here. One is a particularly good one um, of an album that was mastered uh, for a band called Zero Seven. And we actually put all the material onto vinyl acetate before we made the CD. So everything on this album has actually gone on to the lathe. Uh, but as a sideline to that, they asked me to cut a 12-inch single, and I actually cut the 12-inch single direct from the half-inch tape, so it hasn't been digitized. So we can actually hear the resolution difference between the two, but that'll, that'll come a bit later. Um, I've also prepared about 70 um, album and single sleeves of material that I've worked on over the last 30 years. It was done in a hurry. I just literally grabbed piles of records and CDs and scanned them in the other day. Um, but I have actually had a hand in all of this, which I'm quite proud of. Actually, it actually surprised me when I went through it. So, yeah, that's good. Um, I'm going to start off by playing a couple of pieces of music. These, these are before and afters. Um, in simple terms, you're just going to hear a louder, bigger version of what the original actually is. Um, the way to look at what I do is when you go out and buy a finished CD or a finished piece of vinyl, generally it has been mastered and somebody somewhere has looked out for the overall recording level. They've worked with the artist on getting the crossfades and the track, relative track levels right and the overall sound quality has generally been kept as high as it possibly can. So we're all kind of spoilt when we put a CD in a CD player and we press play, we don't have to keep getting up and changing the volume. We don't have to keep getting up and altering the tone because an engineer like me has actually supervised that process for you. When you're making your own tracks, most people are absorbed with the content. They're looking at you know, the instrumentation, the arrangement, uh, the general vibe of the track. And when people bring the stuff into me, you, I can tell what they're trying to say, I can tell what they're trying to do. But what actually happens is that you make a comparison between the stuff they've just literally fresh come out of the studio with against the finished material that's out there being played on the radio, being bought by everybody. And sometimes there's an absolutely enormous difference between what people bring in and what they really want. And that's what my role is, is to supervise that process. I don't try and put any of my own influence in it. I, I pass on my own experience, but I don't say to people, oh, you know, you need to do that, you need to do that. I can just show people uh, a number of ways of doing it. And the way I work is, is quite broad. I have a, a large palette of equipment and methods that I can use. And the result, actually, for some people is actually quite staggering. I, I get engineers that have spent years working. They come up to me and go, how the hell did you get 9 dB more level out of my tracks? I already peaked it at zero. 
and it doesn't sound compressed and limited. And I suppose this is, this is the skill and the art that engineers like me have. We, we put all our years of experience into our work. We generally select our own equipment. Um, as an engineer, I don't use plugins unless a particular job requires it. Um, all of my equipment is outboard equipment, very high quality analog equipment. Um, some of it has been modified and supplied by some of the finest designers on the planet. And some people just like um, their sound going through my equipment. And without it, sometimes it doesn't sound so good. You know, it's just one of those things that happens. So I'm just going to play a couple of things that I've done recently. Um, so the first one I play is before. This particular one, it's the Kooks. Um, it's a single that was in the British charts recently. And the first one is a copy of the master that came from the States, Mike Brow mixed it. Right, and the brief for this job was, um, there was a strange bottom end thing that was making radio transmitters pump, and actually it was changing the dynamics and volume of the recording uh, in, in a rather strange way. So I had to filter out some of that, and, and also duplicate the kind of levels that were done on the album. I didn't master the album, but um, this was the radio version that got approved and was played on, on UK radio. Well, that's what ever <coughs> um, both of those recordings are peaking at digital CD zero. Um, the difference is that after it's mastered, it has an energy and a sound pressure and everyone taps their feet. It sounds almost less like a demo sort of thing. And that's actually a common... Um, a effect a common factor with a lot of the work I do. This is actually quite dramatic. This is um, a track from a new Scritti Politi album. Um, Green has a home studio and his own engineer and they've spent a good year making this record. They came into me, they actually brought their mixing rig into my studio and I gave them my second room and they've been in over the course of a year and they've only just recently finished this. While I was working on it, if there were issues within what I was doing, that perhaps uh, the vocal came out too loud once you raised the gain, they would go back and actually just reduce the vocal in the mix slightly and then give it back to me. So th this is a collaboration between them and, them and me. And I, I kind of, in a way, became part of the production process for this record. Um, I'm going to play about two minutes of each. But, and this is quite dramatic. And this is the mastered version that Green approved. So that's... <laughs> <laughs> oh. So that's what I do. I work with all this wonderful music and get a better energy, more accessible. And um, if it works well, it works fantastically. And it's all done without plugins. So. Um, I think the, the kind of message behind this is that, you know, everyone that makes music generally wants success out of what they do. And there's a lot of people making music everywhere. Um, and the presentation, the delivery of this music is, is what I'm involved with. And it's not enough just to make and record music. You know, the delivery is important. And, and that's why um, engineers like me, we, we specialize in this field. I, I did actually start off uh, in a recording studio with the intention of recording, but um, I, I decided that I'd stick with this. I, I started with vinyl disc cutting and have incorporated CD mastering when CD mastering came out. When you record your stuff, um, you need to kind of decide what you want to do with it. Um, perhaps one track in 50 that I receive in my studio, actually you hardly have to do anything to. Um, most music does need some kind of attention at the mastering stage. Um, it may be a simple leveling exercise between tracks um, for an album if, if someone's got their uh, recording technique together. Um, 
it may be that you need actually more uh, dramatic approach to, um, to what you're doing. I have on hand in my studio um, a good half inch tape recorder that I can actually take data files and reproduce them through a really high quality D to A converter. I use valve converters with my equipment. They, I feel they've got a better energy than transistor ones. And quite often I'll actually put the material onto tape and then start making the CD from that taped version. The Scritti Politi one went that route. When we put it on tape, it suddenly elevated in sound quite considerably. I also have a vinyl disc cutting lathe in my studio. Um, I tend to use similar equipment to work with the vinyl um, system as, as well as the CD. I just replug it and patch it a, a different way. And some artists have actually, um, by choice, kind of decided that they want whatever they hear on the vinyl to be part of what they hear on the CD. And I have a collection of um, CDs here that, that have all been recorded onto vinyl before putting them on CD. They haven't gone to the stage of actually pressing them. Um, we put them onto vinyl acetate. Uh, vinyl acetate is an aluminium disc with a skin on both sides of nitrous acetate. It's a material a bit like nail varnish. It's fairly soft. And when you cut into it, the groove is silent. You hardly hear anything. I mean, People don't really appreciate that when you buy records because they, they pick up crackles and scuffs and whatever. But the actual disc cutting process is very, very good. It's fairly noise free. And we can record the information from a hi-fi deck into our converters. And, and that's how some people have chosen to make their CDs. And it's very effective. I've got various orders in which I can do these things. I think what I'll do, as we're, as we're listening to um, some of the things that people have done, is that I've got a guy here. He's um, a very well-known producer in the 80s. His name's Tim Free Screen. He worked with Talk Talk, and he also wrote with Talk Talk. Um, a couple of years ago, no doubt, had a hit with It's My Life. He co-wrote it. And he used my services. Um, he was probably the most extreme um, session I've had for a long time. Um, he was remixing and remixing. He's got his own home studio, um, very similar in a way to which way you guys are working, uh, digital workstation. And he was bringing in 24-bit data files and. He specifically asked for it to go onto tape and onto the cutting lathe in order to make the recording. Once we'd gone through a good few months of doing this and replacing track, we were building up an album after a, a few months. He then started bringing in vocal overdubs and guitar parts, which he also wanted put through tape, through the lathe. And because we were working with analog systems, the timing of the equipment may not be exactly as precise as digital equipment. So when we got the guitar parts back on the computer, we had to kind of time stretch them a bit just to make sure they, they fitted. And he was building up layer after layer to complete this album. Now, I'll play you a bit of what he's done, because these are sounds you don't normally hear on CD. So uh, this is Tim Free Screen and one of the tracks. He goes under the name of Heligoland. So there we go, that was Tim Free Screen. And there's a, another character that came into me. He's a, it's actually a builder, and he's, it's his dream to make a record. And he's got a bass player in his band. Um, bass player is a recording engineer, mixing engineer. And um, his name's Wally, the artist. He calls himself Sir Walter. And, um, I gave him a couple of days of my time, and he's produced an album. So, you know, he's, he's not signed to a record label. He's 
it's just his dream to have his own record out. And based on, on that, he's now building a website. And this has also uh, been to vinyl. We, we tried different routes, and actually the vinyl route really suited it, especially with the bass playing. So. His records, and has decided to try and create something that's fairly, you know, in his uh, view, fairly authentic to that sort of style that he's been listening to. Um, and there's one other band here. They, the band's Grand National. Um, some of their stuff sounds a bit like The Police. Um, I actually cut Roxanne a long time ago for The Police, and uh, all three of them turned up to the session. <laughs> Blonde-haired lads with a new record, and uh, I cut Roxanne. So, uh, but this is um, again putting the stuff to vinyl. They, they recorded this at home, and um, Rupert, he, he kind of um, originally mixed it uh, to data files and decided at a later date to replace all the tracks by mixing to quarter inch, which again is, is kind of more authentic to the way that the police recordings would have been. And it's a mix of modern styles, a, mi a mix of uh, sampling, but he's, you can hear where he's coming from with this. One of the th things that um, concerns a lot of engineers like myself within the industry is the way uh, everyone is, is listening to uh, much lower grade music these days. Um, and really, everyone is listening on the move. Everyone's, yeah, I can understand why, why that's happening. But um, there is a great concern that um, whole generations are actually going to lose sight of the fact that historically recorded music has been really superb quality. Um, I can give you some sort of facts and figures. Um, a lot of master recordings are actually recorded to tape. Uh, a good quality half-inch tape is approximately four times the resolution of CD. So whenever we record from half-inch tape to, to make a CD, you know, the basic sound is there, but the subtleties start to get lost. When you then reduce that to some MP3 formats, what you're actually listening to is approximately a thirtieth of what's on CD. Um, if you work that out, you know, the, the sound change is actually quite considerable. Um, I had a work experience guy in, he's 14, a couple of weeks ago, has never listened to vinyl, and has just been listening to MP3s. And I played him, I brought, actually brought the record in that I played him. And he was shocked. He, was, he actually had a look of shock on his face, and he just said, that's it, I'm going to go and buy a turntable, and I'm never going to sort of rely on this again. So the, the kind of message is you're, you're all making your own music. And whilst there's nothing wrong with low quality sound in itself, if it's used as a creative thing, I mean, a lot of people use beats that have slightly crusty sounds and whatever. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I would advise all of you at some stage just to look into as higher quality listening system as you can find, because it'll show you more clearly what you're actually doing. Um, you know, you're choosing sounds, I don't know where you're, you know, some, some people record their own sounds. I know Mark has actually hired a recording studio and brought in a drummer and bass player and actually recorded those sounds in order to sample them and then create um, you know, some decent sounding dance records. Other people just take stuff off the internet, they pinch stuff off CDs, and, and generally the, the quality ends up in a downward direction with a lot of these sounds. And in my studio, I, I kind of hear both ends of the spectrum. And I think creatively there's no problem in doing whatever you want to do, but to not be aware that there's this other world out there of superb quality, um, you know, it, it it's a good idea to, to actually be aware of it. So wherever you can, you know, try and audition your stuff on good systems, uh, not just on headphones or on a computer speaker, but to actually take the trouble to get a full frequency range speaker system 
and, and, and use it as a tool, use it as a way of, of actually grading and, and deciding what you're doing. That probably leads on to, um, I've got a comparison here between vinyl and CD. Um, this is the 07 project that I talked about. Now this CD, the, the actual recordings all have been on vinyl and we can um, A, B between the same source recording which was a half inch tape and what the CD sounds like and what the vinyl sounds like. Did anyone hear the difference? <laughs> yes. Okay. So uh, the process here was exactly the same to you decide to go either on LP or CD. Now the, I'll explain what it is. The the master was a half inch master. Uh, they'd recorded it analog multi-track and um, the half inch master was replayed on a, I've got a very specialist machine in my studio. Um, there's an analog uh, hi-fi designer in, in the UK, Tim De Paravicini. He has a kind of reputation within the professional audio field and he designed the tape machine replay electronics that I use. And in, in the case of the vinyl, um, I just literally plugged it into an analog EQ. Um, there's a couple of dBs of analog limiting going on, and I plugged it into the cutting system. So th there is no digitizing. Um, I liken it to potato and chips. This is the potato. Uh, this is the chips. You know, it's it's the sound is the the history of recorded sound. You know, where where recordings come from is is analog and you know, when I grew up, I, I bought a lot of records. I was listening to an analog recording system. And we, we all found it a bit strange when digital came out because we, we had something that was almost perfect. And then, you know, politics and all sorts of other stuff came into play. And, um, you know, we had CD. I can see from a delivery point of view, you know, CD doesn't have the pops and crackles. But, um, you know, mathematically and technically, the CD is a quarter of the resolution of that. And you can hear an element of that in this demonstration. Now, now think about an MP3, which is, could be a thirtieth of the CD, and, and that's what you're losing. That's, that's why vinyl is still a relevant medium. It's a high resolution medium, and I think a lot of people don't really appreciate the fact that it is a high resolution medium. I mean, we spent um, half an hour this morning listening to different record player cartridges in here because I wanted to make sure that you could actually hear this demonstration. And the, the pickup that you use on, on a record player is important. You need to spend a little bit of money to get off the record what's there. A lot of people with their uh, 1200 decks with Concords or Stanton Styli are actually, again, you're probably only hearing 75% of what's on the record. Um, that's what hi-fi is about, you know, a lot of, lot of hi-fi based on record decks is extracting every ounce of that information, but vinyl is a very high resolution medium. I think in a way that's why it's said a lot of people swear by it still, a lot of artists insist on all their material still being on vinyl, and when it comes out like this, you know, I mean, I don't know about you, but I'd much rather listen to that than that, you know. But, uh, Oh, I haven't, actually, I haven't finished the process. Um, with the CD, um, when Henry heard how his tapes cut to vinyl, um, he decided that he would actually have the whole album put onto acetate. But beyond that, it's played back on a high-quality hi-fi deck and then converted to digital beyond that. So, and it's, 
when I was in the room doing it, it's definitely the digitizing process that loses some of that detail. You're just chopping the sound up and sampling it. So that's the process, but the source was the same. Still, that step is the same. Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> I was just wondering how much of the CD being 16 bit and the DVD audio would be far better than 24 bit. It is. Now, it is. That's how correct. much better would it be compared to both? Well, we get a lot of. Um, high resolution sources. Quite a few artists produce uh, 2496 um, sources. And if you imagine a slider scale between sort of CD and good quality analog, then the higher the resolution, the digital, the closer it is to the analog um, end of it. And I would recommend uh, for all of you, if you're working, is to work in the highest resolution that you can whatever you can set your workstations to. I mean, there are practical issues once you start going beyond the 44.1 or 48K sample rate, but at least working 24-bit. These, these differences do move it closer to what the analog actually is. And um, there's another format, Super Audio CD, that's been invented and brought out, and that is another attempt at, at getting it kind of closer. But all, all, all the record industry is doing is getting back to where we were with vinyl. You know, vinyl, towards the end of the 70s, 80s, it, it had reached a peak. You know, you're, you're talking about 60 years of development by a lot of reputable companies in perfecting the way recordings can be made. And then once we went over to CD, it did kind of take a, a step backwards. A lot of the equipment was quite crude. Nowadays, a lot of um, stuff's been learnt from that, a lot of phase correction, a lot of um, work's been put into converters that actually initially convert at a much higher sampling rate, and then they downsample back to 44 for the CD. They're the type of converters that I use. So um, it, I think the message is, is that, you know, be aware of these quality differences. It will affect your work, you know, it definitely will affect your work. I suppose I've, I've sort of touched on this. I've got a, a, a list of things here. General advice, you know, when, once you're um, making your tracks, uh, one of the things I would suggest that you do, everyone makes music within certain genre styles. Put in, import tracks that are already out there. You know, you, you've all got the tracks, but, but don't do it off MP3s. Go out and buy the CDs and place these tracks on your workstations and just make the comparisons. This is the kind of thing that I do every day when people bring tracks in. But do it yourselves. Be aware of what you're doing. And you may think you've got a loud sound or a big sound, and maybe you're just monitoring too loud. And, and when you turn your monitor down because you can't listen to a commercial CD and go back to what you're doing, you might think, oh, you know, I need to work on this a bit harder to get it to work right. So. Just be aware of what you're doing compared to um, what's out there. Um, number two, you know, work at the highest quality you can. Um, if you're sending work to a mastering studio, ideally send high quality data files if that studio can deal with them. Most, most reputable studios now deal with data files. Uh, we do a lot of stuff over the internet. I've got clients all over the world and we have an FTP site set up which is secure. And on a daily basis, clients are moving files backwards and forwards, and we're getting them off the site, mastering them, and sending them back for approval, that kind of thing. So mastering has become a very easy international thing for us now. Um, one of the other things that we've done with our studio, my studio is called Loud, by the way, um, for obvious reasons, but I, de I decided that that was the name that was going to kind of make me a living for a while. So. But we've teamed up with two other studios, and we're on a website called Mastering World. There's a little bit of a CV on me in there. And each engineer has a choice as to how they operate the site, and there are different prices for the engineers and different availabilities, but we get a lot of work. I mean, in one week I had a job from Turkey, something from India, I did a German football song, you know, it's kind of all this stuff was just coming in over the internet, it's just quite interesting. Um, 
And I'd also advise you to attend mastering sessions, if that's at all possible. You do learn a lot. I mean, every engineer that masters uh, is different. You know, I work differently to people that I trained with. Um, but there is some common elements there. We all strive to get the best out of the recordings. And you will learn uh, about it, especially um, with vinyl. Vinyl is a, um, it's an easily distorted medium. Um, some of the things you hear on vinyl, S's, for instance, sibilant qualities in voices. Um, some singers don't actually record to vinyl that well. Um, I remember when I started, um, Queen were the house band in the studio that I started with, and Freddie Mercury's voice wouldn't record to vinyl very well. Um, there were big efforts made to find the right microphones and the right way of, of getting that sound of his through onto vinyl. Uh, his vocals were spitting, you know, very sibilant. It was quite a distraction. Um, so it's, when you attend a mastering session, so you come, come away with some information that will help the next mix you do, the next recording you do. Um, one of the issues that, that we have, um, quite a lot of clients really hammer the mixes, they maximise them. Quite often they, you know, they have an L2 on their computer and they just want to impress everybody and they, they maximise it. And I think there's nothing wrong with trying it and seeing what effect it is, but a lot of mastering studios and mastering engineers, including myself, um, are horrified sometimes when someone gives you something that you can't do anything with. Because um, a good example is that uh, with dance music on vinyl, um, the maximised tracks will give you a good level. But what people don't realise is that the intros are all out of balance. You know, people have a sort of kick drum on the intro and it's like three times as loud as it is within the track. And you have this kind of weird balance where everything's kind of, the more sparse stuff's very loud and the stuff that should be loud is actually suppressed. And you have to be aware of the effect that this has. And to a large degree, it's irreversible. So if you need to um, use limiting and maximizing programs, just be aware that, you know, just don't overdo it. A lot of people will actually send me one that they like with the maximizing and then another mix slightly less of it or, or none at all so that I have a chance to actually apply my skills and my equipment to what I'm doing. So uh, just be aware that you can kill a recording quite significantly by overdoing it. You quite often have to do um, demo CDs to send to record companies that have a decent level on, otherwise they won't get heard, but you know, just be aware that you need to mix it um, slightly um, less, less fierce. And the other thing I'd advise is um, if you are not sure about um, how your CD is going to come out or how your vinyl is going to come out, uh, do a couple of variations to your mix. A very common variation which happens with a lot of albums is that Engineers or producers will give me uh, the master mix and then a vocal up and a vocal down mix. That's very, very common. Um, the reason they do that is it gives you the ability to cut and paste between versions. You can create a, a more interesting track if, if you use um, like the vocal up for the verses and then the master one for the choruses, that's, that kind of thing. If the track is amplified a lot in the mastering process, things like the vocals may come up as a consequence of it and actually be too loud. So then you fall back on the vocal down version and quite often that sounds better. Um, with Mark, Mark's brought in sort of snare up versions when he's been doing some hip hop tracks or bass up, bass down, you know. I think Mark goes a bit mad with it, but uh, you know, it's, it's nice to have a bit of variation if you're going to use the mastering process quite creatively. Um, and some people do bring their, their workstations in. They, they might have, have some stems there where they, they can just quickly piece together a submix and plug the laptop in and we'll work from that. Um, I just recently did a, a cold cut album and um, one of the tracks they mixed actually didn't really have a very powerful bass on it, so they called up the stems, 
and we actually kind of remixed it in the mastering room to make a much fuller track, and that, that track is on the album. So um, preparing for the mastering stage, and, and I mean, you need to have a mastering engineer who's prepared to accept all of this. There are some mastering engineers that won't tolerate this kind of thing. You know, they, 